Hey, Jaywalkers. Happy Sunday. Happy Mother's Day to all of the moms. We appreciate you. We love you, moms. I know I'm thankful for my mom. I'm thankful for my wife and the mom that she is. I'm thankful for grandma and the other moms that I've seen in my life. The example that they give, the strength that they show is amazing and inspiring. Today I'm calling this message when life is too hard. And no matter who you are, there's been a point where life seemed like too much. Whether you're a believer, not a believer, whether you are a person who things come easy to or a person who things come hard to and has to work really a lot to overcome those challenges. There's been a point where you felt like giving up, you felt like quitting, you felt like you couldn't go any further. And like moms, you found the strength somewhere. I think of moms getting up in the middle of the night like my wife's doing right now for a little baby crew. I think of what my mom did for me and I see the story that we're gonna read today in it because there's times where they probably didn't wanna keep going, couldn't keep going. There's times where they needed help. Sometimes they got it, sometimes it didn't really come and they had to just kind of ride it out or push it through. Moms work hard, moms deserve our praise. Thank you moms for all that you do. I've actually had a long week myself, so when I'm talking about when life is too hard, this has actually not been the easiest week for me. We had testing at school and testing week is rough. It's also teacher appreciation week. I work at a school. Um, I'm not a teacher anymore, I was. I'm the principal now. And that basically means, you know, I'm supposed to be appreciating people all week and I do, I appreciate them so much, but it ends up being something you don't wanna miss anybody. You don't wanna make anybody feel like they're not appreciated. So it ends up being a long week. We had grad venture this week, which is my daughter's eighth grade field trip to Universal Studios and Islands of Adventure. And it was actually last night and ended at 2 a.m. We got back to the school. There's always one person who doesn't get picked up. So I'm waiting with the one person who didn't get picked up and we got a baby and he wakes up in the middle of the night and no matter what, he's gonna be up at 7 a.m. and now it's three something and I'm still not in bed last night. And so I'm tired. I wake up in the morning, my, my wife is tired, try to get her a little bit of extra sleep try to take a walk with the baby downtown and with Koa and we come back and we're like, okay, things are kind of settling. Kids are kind of relaxing. Let's try to, let's try to just go take a nap. Like we, we, we can get a few, maybe even hours who ambitious in. Right. And so we go to lay down, maybe it's around noon and Literally, like, the moment that you start to fall asleep, we hear screaming coming into our house. And that's never a good sound. A parent hates to hear that. So Jill and I both pop up and we come out and Cole is bleeding from his chin right here and talking about how he feels like he's gonna pass out and he's got scrapes all over his body and cuts all over himself. So he was swinging on this little swing thing that we have in our yard. It used to be a hammock, but the hammock part broke and now it's just like a wood bar that goes across and he like would run and jump and swing out and swing back on this thing. And it just snapped and broke. And he was kind of fallen and he fell chin first into a cinder block, really like a big concrete block. And uh, then skid alongside of it and it cut up his chest and it cut up his arm. So then it's like, well now what do we do? And you know, I wanna like evaluate it first. Jill wants to take him straight to the hospital. So now we're trying to figure out which one we're gonna do. And we ended up 
eventually taken him to the hospital to urgent care. So I guess instead of a nap for three hours, I got to sit there for three hours and support him getting stitches. Fun, fun. It's just one of those things, you know, like sometimes you don't get a lot of rest and, uh, My wife wanted the house cleaned and the cars cleaned for Mother's Day. And so she had to go return something to the mall and I was like, I'll stay, I'll stay home. I wanna work on cleaning the house. Did the car a little bit earlier, uh, Rio and her did a little bit with the other car. And so almost to the goal, right? What she wants, I know. that. That doesn't sound like the most awesome thing for Mother's Day, but that's what she likes. She likes the house clean and she likes the cars to look nice. So we, uh, I was trying to make that happen. And I told them they can all go. The kids, you can go. Uh, Jill, you can go enjoy yourselves. I'll stay back and I'll take care of the house. And then uh, I'm just about to start and I still got baby crew because he needs to go to sleep. So he goes to sleep at like seven. So it's like seven and I'm feeding him and I sit down in the chair and uh, while I'm feeding him, I feel a tap on my shoulder. And honestly, it kind of scared me for a second. <laughs> I was like, oh, why is something tapping my shoulder? And it was my daughter. She had uh, snuck back in the house or she didn't leave uh, whenever I thought she left because she was gonna stay back and help me. And uh, that meant a lot to me in that moment because she was willing to sacrifice a trip to the mall, which she enjoys, to stay back and help her dad clean the house, which is not fun, honestly. <laughs> she doesn't really like doing that, but she was willing to do that for me. And I just, I love that little girl and I love the heart of that, but on this day with Jesus, nobody stepped up. There was no tap on his shoulder of somebody who was gonna help him. In fact, all of his disciples had left. Peter denied him. You know, Peter's name is Simon. It was Simon before Jesus changed it to Peter and said, on this rock, I'll build my church because the name Peter means rock. And so, if there was going to be any Simon who helped Jesus that day, it should have been Peter. Simon Peter. But it wasn't. He's nowhere to be seen. He's nowhere to be found. He's scattered. And so the Romans had to force someone to help him. To help Jesus. Because he needed help. He couldn't make it any further. Can you believe that? Jesus needed help. He couldn't make it up the hill. Already injured, already hurt, back scratched up, carrying this post of a stick. The vertical piece is probably already up on top of the hill. This piece is scratching into his back. It weighs somewhere between 75 and 165 pounds, depending on which scholar you talk to. And every time he moves, it gets splinters in his back. And he's already dying from loss of blood, from getting beat down. He can't go any further. He's at the point of exhaustion. You've been at the point of exhaustion maybe, maybe not to this extreme. I'd say definitely not to this extreme. I know I've never been to that extreme, but in that moment when he needed help the most, nobody was there to help him. So, the Simon that should have been there is not, so they found another Simon. And this Simon uh, is the Simon that they talk about in verse 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. So he's just getting into town on the way in from Cyrene, which if you don't know where Cyrene is, it's in Northern Africa. So this man has traveled from Northern Africa over to Israel probably for the Passover festivities. There are some who 
would say he probably didn't even know who Jesus was. And I think most people would feel that way. Uh, he's an example of the invitation, however, that Jesus is about to offer all foreigners. In other words, this man's coming in. He's not an Israelite, likely. Maybe he is. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but this man is going to be given the opportunity to go with Jesus to the cross. And that's the offer that all people are going to get really soon. To go with Jesus to the cross, to bear it with him. Uh, but this Simon of Cyrene from Northern Africa is a foreigner. So there's this like debate, like what this guy look like? Because if he's from Northern Africa, that's modern day Libya, where Cyrene was at the time. Uh, so a lot of people are like, this was definitely a black guy, right? Like Simon of Cyrene, Cyrene, totally a black dude. And a black dude helped Jesus carry the cross. Then there's other people who are like, you know, if he if he's coming to this festival, then it's likely that he's one of the dispersed Jews. In other words, back when either Babylon or Assyria attacked Jerusalem and they kind of got scattered to different places, some of them got scattered to Northern Africa and Simon of Cyrene is probably one of those Jewish people who got displaced over there and now he's coming back to celebrate this festival. You know which one it is? We don't know. I love that we don't know, actually, because there were times in the Bible where it's stressed, like this was a dark-skinned person, this was a light-skinned person, this was, you know, a foreigner from this land that looked like this. But in this case, they don't even tell you. You know why they don't tell you, I think, in the Bible? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he's black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Roman, Catholic, Jewish, African, no big deal, right? What matters is that this man had an invitation to help Jesus carry the cross. Now, he may not have wanted to do it. He may not have even known what he was doing. But as soon as he started serving and carrying this cross with Jesus, I believe something in him changed. And I'll, and I'll tell you why I believe that in a little bit. He helped Jesus carry the cross. Then it says uh, they carried it to a place called Golgotha, which is known as the place of the skull. There are theories here with this too. One of them is that uh, it's called the place of the skull because the place of a skull, because a bunch of people have died there. Like that's where they do crucifixions. So there's been a bunch of dead bodies there, a bunch of skulls, right? There's other people who say, uh, no, it's called that because the hill was kind of barren at the top and the shape of it looked like the top of a skull. Maybe there were like rocks or a certain pattern on the hill that made it look like that. My favorite one is actually a theory that they called it the place of the skull because that's where David, King David, brought the head that he cut off of Goliath. And that that skull is actually at that location too to signify once again uh, a meek and humble man defeating something that looks way more powerful, sin and death. So all of those theories are there. They're pretty cool. You can pick which one you like and the Bible doesn't clarify which one it is, but they're all pretty neat. And then it says, uh, next it says that they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. So this was like a, like a medicine almost at the time. So when you mixed wine with myrrh, it would kind of dull the pain it would be like a narcotic or something that would make it less painful. Like, but Jesus didn't want it. He wanted the full experience of the pain. He wanted to take it all. And he was in a lot of pain to the point that he couldn't even carry this cross on his own. It was too hard for him to do on his own. It says, and they crucified him and divided his garments. So now we see a couple of prophecies fulfilled. They're dividing it, casting lots for it. That's a prophecy fulfilled. There's robbers on either side of him. There's more mocking and more taunting. So we see all these things happening as Jesus is unable to even carry his own cross to the location that he's going to be killed. Um, 
that mocking and that taunting still hasn't stopped. You know, when we're going through something, when life feels too hard, sometimes that mocking and that taunting is happening from other people. Sometimes that mo mocking and taunting is happening inside of our own heads. And I'm gonna be honest with you, this is, for me, this is take three of this message tonight. And it's nighttime for me. It's actually after midnight right now. It's like 12.33 a.m. And, uh, and I'm still up from that long night last night and that long day today. And there was a point where I was just thinking like, don't even, don't even do the message. What's the point? No, people aren't even gonna care. Like, no one cares. No one's listening. They don't listen to the messages. I'm just, you're wasting your time. Just go to sleep. You're tired. Right? And, and I heard all those things in my head, especially after, you know, I would have to start over again because I didn't like where it was going. Um, and I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that Jesus probably felt those same feelings. Because there are people telling him, like, just save yourself. Just do this. Like, what you're doing is stupid. What you're doing is pointless. Like, just stop. Give up. Like, stop trying. What are you doing? And uh, Jesus probably was tempted, just like I am, to take the easy way out. But he didn't. And I'm preparing this message today. This message of not giving up. This message of not quitting. This message of even when it's too hard, keep going. And that's what Jesus is doing. It's not that he's not trying. He's completely exhausted, but he's still going. He's still pushing. He's still committing to, to going to the cross. So even if... Uh, you're the only person tonight, the person that's listening right now, if you are the only person that listened to this message, it was worth it. Because with Jesus, his death on the cross was made available to everyone, but not everyone received it. He would have done it just for one person. So as long as one person is hearing this today, I want you to know that God would do it just for you. And tonight, I was encouraged by Jesus and by his example to do it, even if just one person hears. The gospel message is for everyone. He died for everyone, but everyone uh, will not accept his gift. You know, there's one other uh, thought that I had while I was kind of preparing this. It was, I wonder what Simon did when he got Jesus to his destination. Because, like, that's kind of weird, right? Like, you come into town, you're just on your way in, and they grab you, probably away from your family, and say, hey, carry this thing for this man who's a criminal. You're like, I don't want to do that. But then you end up doing it, and you see his resolve. You see something different in this man. Maybe he even said some things to him or he saw some of the conversations or some of the looks, some of the compassion of Jesus. And while he's helping him carry it, you know, something's probably changing inside of him about how he feels about this man. And when he gets to his destination, it's just kind of done. It's just kind of like, thanks, bye. And I wonder like what happened next? Well, when you look back at verse 21, we actually get an answer to that. A lot of scholars think. It says in verse 21, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Why would it say the father, father of Alexander and Rufus? Like, why is that relevant information? And I think the answer to that, and a lot of people think this same thing, people who have studied this even more than me, they think that the reason why they said the father of Alexander and Rufus is because Mark, Mark knew Alexander and Rufus. And the audience that Mark was writing to also knew Alexander and Rufus. And Alexander and Rufus were still around. 
Alexander and Rufus were companions of these guys. And if we go back into the book of Romans and we look at chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Now, is that the same Rufus? I can't 100% say that it is, but I think it is. And what we see there is we see Rufus being a follower and a companion and a person who has committed his life to Jesus. And my guess is his mom the same, his dad the same, his brother the same, this entire generation of people changed by the life of Jesus because they were asked to carry something for this man that they didn't even know. And they saw in him something different. So if it is him, it means that his whole family, Simon's whole family, believed as a result of this encounter. That their whole course of time and their eternity were changed because of this one thing. Um, and I will say that for me, it was never hearing about Jesus. It was never studying about him. It was never being told by somebody about him that made me a follower of Jesus. It actually was when I began to serve him. It was actually when I began to think of like helping someone other than myself. And, and for me that happened when I was like very low in my life, when things seemed kind of too hard. I felt very alone. And instead of just wallowing in that, I went and served at a church because they needed help. And that ended up showing me who Jesus really was. Because when we carry his cross with him, it changes us. And that has changed my whole family too. So here's uh, my, my takeaway from today. When life is too hard, keep going just like Jesus did. Keep going and look to help others carry their cross. Notice I didn't say look to have someone help you carry yours because Christ is there to do that with you. And he's not weak anymore. <laughs> I promise you that we're the weak ones now and he's the one helping. Uh, but we get to look to help others carry their cross. And we shouldn't have to be forced to do it. Just like my daughter who decided to stay and help me clean the house tonight. And what that did in my heart was that gave me extra energy to do a great job. Let's pray. God, thank you for this example of Jesus that when things were hard in his life, when he couldn't bear any more, not only did he continue and keep going, but God, you made a way for him to get to the finish line. You brought someone in his life to help him. God, I pray that you would help us to be that person for somebody. Help us to see who needs that. Help us not to have to be forced to do it, but to choose to do it. And God, I also pray that if we're just going through it and if we're just hurting right now and if we need somebody, that you would send somebody. God, send that person to help us. Because there are times that are overwhelming and that even happened to you when you walked the earth as Jesus Christ. So God, I thank you for his example. And I pray that I can continue even when those mocking voices and those things in my head and the circumstances and the surroundings seem like they're too much. God, I believe Jesus died for me and that that's what he endured all of this for. That he did that so I could be made right with you. And I accept that gift of salvation that he offered me today. I give you my heart. I give you my life. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. I want to keep going and I want to help others carry their burdens. God, help me to do that just like Jesus did. I love you and I thank you and it's in his name I pray. Amen. Well, welcome to the family of believers. I know uh, this is a little bit 
over what I usually do as far as length, but hopefully it was worth it and you got something out of today. Love you guys. Have a great day. See you soon. Bye, Jay Walkers.